He did not stop creating. He did not stop being the creator. If you need a creative miracle, he's the creator. The narrow road is the more difficult road. But the narrow road is the one that leads to eternal life. excited about the word that the Lord has today. Do you guys get excited about God's word? You know, I get really excited about his word. Every day when I get up in the morning and I, I pick up the Bible to read it, I get excited because the Lord always speaks to me through his word. That's the number one way that God speaks to his children is through his word. Did you know that? If you say, well, I never hear God speaking. I don't know what he's saying. Read the Bible. He said it all. He said everything right here <laughs> in the Bible. So don't say God doesn't talk to you. He does. And he will talk to you through his word. And he uses his word many times to speak prophetically to us. He will um, just highlight a scripture to us. And we know that that scripture is for us. And all uh, inspired prophetic words have to be filtered through the word of God. If it doesn't line up with the word of God, it's not a true word from the Lord. Amen? It's got to be filtered through the word of God. If it's not in there verbatim, the spirit of God is going to be there. The spirit of the, the word will be in the word that was given. Amen? So I'm excited about today's message. Today's message is entitled, Oh, What a Savior. That last song, they added that because I said, can you please sing that song that says, oh, what a savior. You know, I was thinking about what an awesome God that we serve. What an amazing savior that we have. We are saved from death and destruction. We are saved from the fires of hell. We are saved from sickness and disease. Oh, what a savior we serve. We have a mighty God. We have a, a tremendous, wonderful, powerful God. Oh, what a Savior. You know, this month being the month that we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, all of our, our messages this month are focused around the Savior, the birth of the Savior, the life of the Savior. Because Jesus is the reason for the season. Amen? It's not about Santa Claus. It's not really about Christmas trees or lights. And all of that's fun. But it's about Jesus, the Savior. <laughs> Jesus, the Savior. Do you remember Pastor Andrew that was here in, back in October? And he preached on a Wednesday night, a Tuesday and a Wednesday. He was from Kenya. You remember that, brother? That was here. Well, we were at a fun run yesterday, and they were taking uh, pictures with Santa Claus. And so our group got together and just took a fun, silly picture with Santa Claus. Well, he saw the picture, and uh, he said, I can just hear him in his accent from Kenya. He said, and, and what is that man sitting down in the chair? What's that about? <laughs> and I said, well, that's what we call Santa Claus in America. You know, I said, he's just a... Should I say pretend? <laughs> a pretend person that, you know, brings us gifts. It's just, you know, a fairy tale. And he had never heard of it before. And I thought, wow, I did not know that they didn't have that in their culture. But Jesus is the reason for the season. It's all about him. All about him. And I want us in... To focus in on him on, in all the hustle and bustle that goes on around Christmas. I've been going here and there and putting decorations out and preparing and getting ready for my son and his family to come and stay with us at Christmas. And I've been shopping and getting the gifts ready and buying the wrapping paper. I have not put wrapping paper on one box yet, but I will. Or one sack, <laughs> but I will. But in all of that, we can get so caught up with everything around the holiday that we don't focus on Jesus. But let's remember Jesus in this season because it really is all about him. 
In Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, this was prophesied over 700 years, between 700 and 1,000 years before Jesus was even born. It's an accurate prophecy. There's so many prophecies prophecies in the Bible concerning the coming of our Savior. And one of them is found in Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it, and with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. That last sentence stood out to me like a neon light when I read it that the zeal of the Lord will perform it. He will bring the Messiah at the perfect time. The zeal of the Lord will perform it. What is the zeal of the Lord? It's his passion for us. He had to send a savior to save us from our sins or we would have been doomed to destruction forever because of the original fall in the Garden of Eden. But because he had a zeal and a passion for his people, he said that his zeal would perform it. And Jesus will be the king. And he will reign forever and ever and ever. And of his government, there will be no end. One day, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And he's going to sit in his rightful place as king and ruler. And he will judge with judgment and righteousness and justice, the Bible says. Oh, what a savior we serve. Mighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, and the prince of peace. All rolled up in that little bundle of joy that they wrapped up with swaddling cloths and laid him in a horse's trough, in a manger, because there wasn't any room for him in the inn. Isn't that amazing? What a humble servant. God had a perfect appointed time that he would send the Savior. All the prophecies leading up to his birth were going to be fulfilled perfectly. And God had that appointed time. And it wasn't going to change. And he sent the Son right at that time. Was it, what is, excuse me, was it an accident that Mary was on her way to Jerusalem? Was it an accident that there wasn't any room for him in the inn? Was it any accident that they end up having to flee to Egypt? God had everything in his hand and in his perfect timing. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son then, an heir of God through Christ. You're not a slave, you're a son. You're a daughter. You belong to the Lord God Most High if you are in Christ. He who has the Son has life. He does not have the Son, does not have life. The Bible says that so, so clearly. In verse 5, it says, to redeem those who were under the law. It says Jesus came and he was born under the law, but he came to redeem those from the law, but he also came to fulfill the law. Hallelujah. Because we couldn't do it, we could never do it because we weren't sinless. Even the priests had to make sacrifices for themselves that they might even offer a sin offering for the rest of the people. But he came to redeem those. He came to redeem you and me. 
And his spirit is in our spirit, the verse says. And that we have that spirit of adoption and we are sons and daughters because of what God did through Jesus Christ. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir of God through Christ. If you're an heir, that means you have everything that Jesus has. Everything that God delegated to Jesus, you have it. He delegated that power and authority to Jesus, and Jesus delegated it to us, the believer. Do you believe that? You need to believe that. Jesus has always been from the very beginning. Sometimes we think about Jesus just coming as a little baby and, and laid in the manger, but he was before then. He was all over the Old Testament. I love the places where it shows the pre-incarnate Christ the angel of the Lord, the captain of the Lord's host, the captain of the Lord's armies. That was Jesus. And it says in John 1, verse 1 through 5, that in the beginning he was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through him, and without him, nothing that was made was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus came into the world, and he came as the light, but the religious leaders of that time did not see him as the light. They only saw him as a threat. They thought, how can this be the Messiah? said that the darkness did not comprehend him. The world, those that were in sin, even those in the church at that time, did not comprehend who he was. Nobody expected him to be sleeping in a barn. Nobody expected him to be such a humble servant and so meek and merciful. They were expecting a ruler of some kind, a governor, someone who is going to sit on a throne in a kingdom here and now on earth. They probably got that idea from Isaiah 9, 6 that we just read. And the government will be upon his shoulders. Yes, it's going to be, but it wasn't going to be in that time, in that place. He came just as a humble man. In John 1, verse 10 through 14, it says, the word became the flesh. He came in the flesh. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name. Do you believe in his name? If you believe in his name, you have the right to become the child of God. If you've never accepted him, believe in his name today, and you will have the right to become the sons and the daughters of God. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to be by yourself in this world. You don't have to be doomed to destruction like this world will be someday. You can be a son. You can be a daughter of the Lord God Most High. He's given you that right if you will believe in his name. Verse 14, or 13. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It says in Hebrews 2, 9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned him with glory and honor. And he by grace, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He was willing to condescend to this earth in an earthly body with flesh and blood just like us. 
He didn't bring his glory and his splendor and his crown. He didn't come riding into Jerusalem on an elephant, but on a donkey. He humbled himself. He was willing to be made lower than the created angels of heaven. He was above them. He was God. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. And he was willing to come in the flesh. And he had to come in the flesh so that he could suffer death for us. He was the penalty. He paid the penalty for our sins in his own body on the cross. And it says right here in this verse that that's where he got his glory and his honor. When he hung on the cross for you and for me. I'm going to read that part again. It says, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Say, and me. That's everyone and you. It doesn't matter what kind of life you've been living. It doesn't matter how long you've been gone from the Lord. It doesn't matter how long you've been running. God still loves you and he still wants you as a son or daughter. The Bible says that if we repent, that means to ask for forgiveness, but also to turn our back on the things of darkness and to go the other direction towards God. It says that he'll forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's no reason why someone cannot be saved. You are not too great of a sinner. His grace is greater. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. His grace is to help us overcome sin, not an opportunity to sin. Hallelujah. Matthew 1, 20 and 21, Jesus, our Savior. But while he thought about these things, who's the he, Joseph? Mary's betrothed husband. They were engaged. They had not come together yet as man and wife. And now Mary's pregnant. And she's not married. That's pretty scandalous, especially in those days. She could have been stoned to death. But Joseph, the Bible said, being an upright man and, and loving Mary and didn't want to put her to public shame, the angel of the Lord came to him. And it says, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary for your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. I love that verse in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And it, I'm going to read verse 21 again, and it says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. Jesus means Savior. The word is literally translated Savior. You will name him Jesus, Savior, for he will save his people from their sins. It goes on to say in verse 22, Matthew 1, 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God loved us so much, he sent himself in the form of Jesus to be born of a man, to die for our sins, and he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He can be with us and he can be in us, God with us. He's going to save his people from their sin, and he's going to be God with us in the earth. In Philippians 2, 7 and 8, it talks about how Jesus humbled himself as a man. It was, being, was so willing to endure whatever he had to endure to secure our salvation. He ransomed us with his very own blood. In Philippians 2, verses 7 and 8, it says, 
but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. The worst of the worst were crucified. That was the most torturous death that they could give someone is to hang them on the cross. Many times as Jesus, they were scourged first and then they were hung on a cross and they hung there for hours until they finally died. It was agonizing. And Jesus said yes to the cross. That's beyond me. I don't know how he did it except by the grace of God. We know in the garden he prayed fervently and he was able to endure the cross for us. He humbled himself to the point of death. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve others. Jesus said that of himself. It goes on to say in Philippians 2, 9 and 11, that he has the greatest name that's ever been named under heaven. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name and that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those of the earth and those under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of the Father. Everybody is gonna hit their knees someday. If you don't do it now, you're gonna do it at the great judgment. And trust me, you don't wanna leave this world without Jesus because it is not gonna go well for you. I remember what Isaiah Reed would always say when he would come and visit us. He said, uh, don't die without Jesus, don't die. If you don't have Jesus, don't die. He knows, he died and went to hell and came back. And he has the autopsy report and everything. He was dead, he was cut from stem to stern. They were already starting on his autopsy when his mother called and raised him from the dead over the phone. Quite a testimony. He has the medical documentation that proves it. If you don't know Jesus, don't die. Don't risk it, I wouldn't. Nothing is worth eternity in hell. But it says everyone is gonna bow their knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Even those in hell and under the earth, they're gonna bow their knee to the name of Jesus Christ, the greatest name that's ever been spoken, Savior. The only name whereby men must be saved. There's no other name, there's no Buddha, there's not the gods of um, India, not all of the, the other idols, not Baal, not any of these other so-called gods have ever died for you, have ever loved you, could ever redeem you, was ever sinless, only Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven and that's through Jesus. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. The only way, the name that's greater than any name. It's in the name of Jesus that demons tremble. It's in the name of Jesus that people are set free. It's in the name of Jesus that people are healed. It's in the name of Jesus that everything that is glorious will happen in his name. There's no other name. Jesus was such a, a merciful Savior, such a humble Savior, that he was willing to go to the whipping post before he was crucified. Isaiah 53 gives us a perfect prophetic word of what was going to happen to Jesus before it ever happened, hundreds and hundreds of years before it ever happened. And everything in Isaiah 53 came to pass perfectly. Go back and read the whole thing. I'm just gonna read verse four and five this morning. But it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. We have all transgressed the laws 
and the covenants and the regulations and the promises of God. That's a trespass. For he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities. Our iniquities are those sins, those repetitive sins, those sins that are even passed down from generation to generation to generation. Usually these sins grow more wicked as they go. He's forgiven us of our iniquities. He's been bruised for our iniquities. And it says the chastisement or the punishment for our peace was upon him. He took the punishment. We got the peace. Amen. What a great exchange. We got the best end of that. And it's by his stripes we are healed. Are healed. You are the healed. Are healed. Not going to be. Are healed. You are healed healed. Jesus already paid the price. It's in the name of Jesus that you are healed today. We just have to believe it, appropriate it into our life. Sometimes we don't see the manifestation of our healing right away. Maybe we receive prayer, but we still feel pain. So we think in our mind, well, I'm just not, I'm not healed. Don't think that way. Jesus already paid the price. Begin to confess that you're healed. Call those things that be not as though they were. Even though you don't see it, confess that it is. Make a good confession over it. You know, the Bible says that we'll be snared by the words of our mouth. Our Savior is going to return one day. Don't think that... He's not coming back because he hasn't come back yet. Every since even when the scriptures were written, people were saying that his coming is near, right? His coming is near. In my grandmother's day, they said his coming is near. In my parents' day, they said his coming is near. In our day, they're saying his coming is near. But you know what? It's nearer than it was yesterday. The Bible says that God is not slack in keeping his promises, but he's very patient and he's waiting for us to get saved. He's drawing us by his mercy every day and his goodness and his kindness. He doesn't want one person to be lost for eternity, not one. That's why he hasn't come back yet. He is merciful. Do you have family members that you're still praying for? I know Mio does. She just said it this morning. I have family members I'm still praying for. Do you have people in your family that don't know the Lord yet? Don't stop praying for them. Don't stop. But God is not lax. He's not slack. He's not late. And he's definitely not not coming, if that makes sense. <laughs> He is coming back. God is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Know that. And we need to live every day if today is the day that he returns. Sometimes we just, we get lax. We're the ones that are slack, not him. And we get off on our own things and we go down these rabbit trails that lead us away from God instead of to God. But if we'll repent... If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you learn one verse in the Bible, learn that one. Amen. Amen. Learn that one. Amen. But our Savior will return. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, it gives us a glorious picture of our mighty Savior. He might have come in humbly but he's coming back as the king. He's coming back with fire in his eyes. He's coming back for a church, for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Hey, we still got some spots and wrinkles we need to iron out. But he's coming back for a holy church. He's coming back for a church where we have made him our first love. Revelation 1, verse 12. 
Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. So he had a golden sash. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, and if refined in a furnace, and his voice as of the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand the seven stars. Out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. He was so bright and so glorious he shone like the sun. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me and he said to me, do not be afraid for I am the first and I am the last. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death, hallelujah. When he died, he descended for he to hell for us. He took our place and he ascended to heaven and he took his very own blood and he sprinkled it in the tabernacle of heaven on the mercy seat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he atoned for every sin that we would ever commit now and for eternity. Does that mean that we can just keep on sinning and never turn from our wicked ways? No. There is a portion that we have to do. He paid the price, but we, the requirement is repentance. Amen. Requirement is to receive him as savior and to invite him in your heart. Ask him to be your Lord and your savior. Are we gonna be perfect Christians? No, none of us are going to be perfect Christians. Sometimes we're gonna make a mistake. Sometimes we're gonna sin. Sometimes we're gonna get off track and we need to get back on track. But when you sin, and when you get off track, and when you do things that you shouldn't do, and you begin to feel far away from God, remember that you have an advocate with the Father. That's what his word says, but when you sin, know that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He would be there pleading your case. Oh Lord, this son of mine, He's praying to me right now, this son of yours. He's covered in my blood. He's asking for forgiveness. Wipe away his sins. Cleanse him, O oh Lord. It says that Jesus is at the right hand of God forever making intercession for the saints. Someone's praying for you and it's Jesus. <laughs> I tell you, that encourages me. That Jesus is praying for me and he's praying for you. It's not too late. It's not too late. If you would stand with me this morning, I wanna give you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, God is so good and so merciful and so kind. It says his goodness and his kindness leads us to repentance. Do you feel the love of God this morning for you? Do you feel his goodness and his kindness? I do. He's leading you back to him. Wherever you've been, know that you can turn around and come home. Whatever's gone on in your life, know that you can ask God to forgive you, and he will. And if you ask him to give you the grace to overcome that sin, he will help you. You know, many of us, we're not exempt from sin. Many of us have a sin that it seems like you fall into it over and over. God wants to heal you and deliver you from that thing that is continually snaring you. 
And I want to pray for you today to, to be delivered and completely free from that sin that ensnares you. So if you want prayer today, I want you to come to the front. I'm going to pray. Can y'all put some music on, please? I want you to come to the front. And I want to pray for your salvation, but I also want to pray for those that you just need freedom from that thing that continually bothers you, that ensnares you. Because God is merciful.